This nugget focuses on Scrum artifacts, or in other words, Scrum deliverables or Scrum working documents. Because Scrum is described as being documentation light, we typically don't use the formal term deliverables or even documentation associated with Scrum. So the term that has become quite popular in our Scrum vocabulary is calling these evidences of work Scrum artifacts. And consistent with the fact that Scrum is lightweight, we only have four Scrum artifacts and there are people who would suggest there's really only three, that the last three on my list, the product backlog, all of the work needed or remaining in total, the sprint backlog, the work assigned to a sprint, and the progress charts, the burn down or the burn up charts that track the progress you're making on the sprint. So a lot of people suggest there are only three artifacts associated with Scrum and these, these three, I would suggest at least I believe that the user story is also a Scrum artifact. As a matter of fact, I believe that the user story is fundamental to the Scrum artifacts because the product backlog is made up of user stories, as is the sprint backlog, and the progress charts record our progress completing user stories. So let's delve in and find a little bit more about what a user story is. The user story, as I said, I believe is the foundation, the fundamental artifact for Scrum development. The user story is all of the work required. How user stories are presented will be based on the individual dynamics of your project environment. Most Scrum pundits would suggest the user story should be handwritten and as evidenced by my attempt at being an artist on a plain three by five or some similar sized index card. And there's a lot of reasons that we suggest the user story should be presented on an index card. I will attempt to try to describe these to you. One is it's small. You can't put a lot of text on a three by five index card. So it insists on brevity and recognizing that the team has the right to refuse to work on a story if they feel the story is not complete by insisting on brevity by the pure size of the index card we are in fact in insisting on small discrete stories so as i mentioned in one of my introductory nuggets a story called shipping product is not a story at all. It's an epic and that epic is going to break down into many, many stories. So an epic of shipping product would break down into many user stories where the user stories would break down into identify product to ship. That would be a user story. Determine available inventory. That would be a story. Deplete inventory with quantity shipped would be a story. So our stories become very small as necessitated by the size of our index card, the medium we're providing. The next key consideration of why we put it on the index card is it's portable. It's no longer logged in a database. It's no longer a large complex word document. It's a small index card. So as we'll see in a few minutes when we discuss, start discussing our product backlog and our sprint backlog, 
The fact that the index card is portable allows the team member to physically take that card off of the backlog board and take the card in hand, go and find the product owner and sit down and have a conversation to get the additional details of what's included in the user story. So, very fundamental expression of what a user story should be. It should be contained on a plain, doesn't have to be plain, you can use colors if you want to, you can have lines on it if you want to, but a standard 3x5 index card. It can be a little bit bigger, it can be done in post-it notes, it can be done on any combination of the above that's going to work in your environment, but most Scrum supporters would suggest that it should be handwritten, so that it is easy to change. And you may say, well, handwritten isn't easy to change. If I want to change a handwritten user story, I have to get it white out, I have to, to white it out, I have to erase the pencils, I have to go and exert myself to change this handwritten uh, user story, why wouldn't it be far easier to change if it was maintained in electronic format in a Word document? Well, the fact is, because it is so small and so brief, if we want to change a user story in this format, we literally take the old plain index card, throw it in the trash can, and start afresh. And because it's handwritten, we don't have a lot of investment in it. We do not have that same oh, do I really want to delete this? Maybe I should, uh, sh I'll make a copy of it. Maybe I should turn on tracking changes in my word processing software. All of those standard rituals that we would go through with maintaining a formal word processing document are eliminated by putting it in the handwriting format. There is less emotion, if that's the appropriate term, attached to the user story. Oh, it's changed, let's throw it out. So with these reasons of why we want to keep it on an index card behind us, let's focus on what a user story should contain. And as you can see, there are three main parts of what I would describe as an appropriate user story. One is the story itself. And in an attempt to make the user story uniform to ensure that we're capturing the same type of data on every user story, no matter who writes it, I would suggest you need to capture the same basic information. And I'm not saying this has to follow exactly this format, but I would suggest we want to capture the same basic information as a type of user, so as a manager or as a data entry, or as a knowledge worker. So identify the type of user, and we want to identify the type of user so that when the team member works on the story, they get in, get in the mindset, oh, this story is for a manager, so therefore a manager typically wants summarized management information, or this story is for a data entry clerk. They're doing transactional data entry, so therefore they're going to want it very granular and very detailed and so on. So as a type of user, I need to do something. And this is really what the story is. As a warehouse clerk, I need to validate amount of inventory on hand so that a result is achieved so that I can verify enough stock exists to fulfill the customer order. So that would be a very complete user story. As a warehouse clerk, I need to validate the amount of inventory on hand so that I can ensure enough inventory exists to ship the customer order. So I would put a period after that and say, my definition of the user story is done. I have truly defined the business requirements. The next step is the definition of done. 
and I've already introduced the definition of done in the previous nugget. The definition of done is the measure that the product owner is going to apply during our sprint review meeting. But we need to have the definition of done proactively. And just like the concept of test-driven development, which is an agile development routine, we need to understand what the definition of done is so that we can do all of the work and only the work required to ensure that we can prove that the definition of done is, is complete. So again, using that example of the warehouse clerk validating enough inventory is on hand so that a, the customer order be, can, can be shipped, the definition would, of done would be an indicator that inventory exists or sufficient in, inventory exists. We probably need to be a little more elaborate of that. How is that indicator going to be done? It will be a visual indicator on the screen for the forklift driver that says sufficient inventory exists. Or definition of done will be when the system validates that enough inventory is on hand, a green tick box will appear beside that line item on the order. So again, we are very clearly defining what the definition of done is, how the product owner is going to measure the success. And I believe both of these steps need to be done before the user story is selected to be included in the sprint. The team needs both the definition of the story and the definition of done. This third part of the user story will be filled in at some point. Often when we're initially creating the user story and the definition of done, we're simply saying, this is a story. I'm not really sure what the business value is. I'm not sure what the priority is. All I know is it's a user story and I'm gonna put it out on the product backlog. And we'll get to the product backlog in just a moment. As the product owner is reviewing and it's a term we use called grooming. As the product owner is grooming the product backlog, the product owner is gonna review the story associated with validating inventory and say, business value, this is pretty high. There's a lot of value in ensuring that there's enough product in the warehouse before I accept the order for the customer. What's the priority? Well, the priority is not as high because I already know that my first priority is customer maintenance. And my second priority is, and I think I believe we came up with the fourth priority is shipping product. So again, based on our release strategy, we know that the priority for this particular user story is relatively low in the grand scheme of things and therefore this particular user story will not be selected for a sprint until much farther in our release cycle. So as each user story is done it's posted to the product backlog and again excusing my artistic abilities I believe the product backlog again is a very manual process. We take each user story and we literally pin it to the product backlog, in which case I'm suggesting my product backlog is a very, very large cork board that I can literally use stick pins and pin each and every one of my stories to the product backlog. And I believe I want to have a degree of order to my product backlog, so I have sprint ready stories. These are stories that the product owner believes have the level of detail that's appropriate for passing it off to the project team once it's selected for a sprint. So these are our stories that have all of the details 
the, the details of what the story wants, the definition of done are complete, and obviously the business priority and the, the importance are complete so that they can begin to be scheduled and selected for inclusion into a sprint. And there's going to be a significant number of stories that should be sprint ready. We should be at least three to four sprints ahead. So as we're working on a sprint, the product owner is going to be over at the product backlog, the cork board, reviewing material to determine are these sprint ready. We want to always have enough in reserve that we can move into the next two or three sprints and have a vision for where we're going to go. The next level is the business stories. These are in the product owner's humble opinion at least complete stories but it needs just a little more work perhaps the definition of done is not complete perhaps the prioritization and the business importance is not done so we have the the basics of what the business story is but there's just a little bit more work our goal again is over time as we groom the product backlog is to add the details into these pending business stories to groom them to give them the little more work to do the definition of done to validate the priority to validate the importance and move them across and again that's why we want to have these on the index card the product owner comes to this section of the product backlog says I'm going to take this this story so literally takes the stick pin takes it off of the board takes it to their desk takes it back to a business unit goes talks to a, a subject matter expert and fills in the blanks completes the business story and then takes it over here and posts it onto the sprint ready stories another aspect of grooming is to take the large stories the epics and again groom them and move them up so in this instance again the product owner has some extra time says here is an epic that's that I've been interested in some period of time removes the pin takes it away goes back to his or her desk with a, a number of blank index cards and says okay this large epic of ship product I'm going to groom it and I'm going to take that large epic and I'm going to break it down into five or whatever the appropriate number of user stories. And maybe the first step of doing that grooming is simply to say this epic of ship product resulted in five new user stories and I'm going to fill in the first piece only. As a warehouse clerk I need to so that end result is is produced we create the skeleton of those five user stories and we post them up here in the business stories remaining to be completed and then over time we'll come back and we'll groom them and we'll complete them and eventually move them over to sprint ready stories I prefer to do another level of categorization of my user stories so and, and I can almost put a, a large line not that I'm trying to, to truly differentiate and make some stories different than other because all stories should be considered equal but these are stories that the expectation will turn into functional code these are business needs but the product the project has other needs as well we may have documentation needs we may need a user's guide we may need an operations guide we may need various other forms of documentation my suggestion is you create a user story or a story that says write chapter 3 of the op guide and we call that a user story it's work the team has to do the team should be working on nothing other than stories assigned to them in a sprint so therefore if we need to write chapter 3 of the operations guide it should be a story and it should have a priority 
and a value. And as the product owner is grooming the product backlog, the product owner should say, okay, this story for writing chapter three of the operations guide, the time has come. I need to get that information in front of my operations department. So again, takes the pin out of that story, moves it over here as a sprint ready, which is right chapter three of the operations guide. And the same principle applies for training stories. Maybe we need to conduct a training. User training on function X. That would be a story. When the time comes that that story needs to be executed, i.e. that we need to conduct that user training, again, the product owner through the grooming process will take the pin out, remove the story, and move it over here to sprint ready for training and that story would then be selected for the next sprint and scheduled to be executed delivered in the next sprint so these again are business focused stories but are non code based stories but should be treated in the same way my next piece of my product backlog i'm going to call team stories and although I have a direct block down here for team stories, these are stories that is oriented by the team. Some of these team stories are going to be purely related to the elimination of technology debt. So again, using the example that we used earlier, we had an inefficient search. So as soon as the team made the determination that they were going to allow this inefficient search to be implemented, the team should have created a story called improve, fix the inefficient search and put it up on the technology debt board. And again, put priority and value. Now, my humble experience is as the business owner is grooming the product backlog, there seems to be an invisible shield right down this part of the product backlog. And the product owner sees everything over here in these left three sections of my product backlog very, very well, but seems to have total invisibility over here to this part of my product backlog, which is again, what I'm calling my team stories doesn't see the technology debt for improving the product search. It's working, it's not optimal, but you know what? I'm not sure I really want to invest the team's time. So this is again where some of the trade-offs happen in the sprint planning meeting, where the team literally sticks up the hand and says, this story is critical. This story is hindering our ability to do X, Y, and Z. This story absolutely needs to be included and the team may insist that again, this story gets removed from the technology debt and moved over here into the sprint ready technology debt for acting on in one of the next several sprints. The same applies down here for team stories. I've, I've distinguished between technology debt because technology debt are stories that must be dealt with eventually. If we do not eliminate our technology debt in our project, our project is going to have huge long-term problems. And we'll talk much more about technology debt later in the series. The rest of these team stories are not directly related to technology debt, but it may be I need a new build server. I need training on Java for a new team member. I need a bigger product backlog corkboard. Probably not as urgent to be dealt with, but they are things that the team is requesting permission to do. And that's what a team story is. Permission to work on any of these in the sprint. And again, often the product owner 
does not see the side of the board so often again the team needs to stand up in the sprint planning meetings that says you know what the fact that we don't have this build server is really really impacting our ability to move forward you really need to take pay attention to this and we again we literally force it to be removed and moved over to include the build server And a final note on the product backlog is no work should ever be attempted by the team that isn't part of the product backlog. No work should be found in a sprint that didn't first find a staging area over here in the sprint ready stories. And there is absolute flexibility with managing this product backlog. Again, what we call grooming. At any point in time, the business has the right to add new stories anywhere they want. Here are three new stories that are almost ready. Here's a new epic. The team has permission to add new stories down here at any point in time. As already discussed, the team has absolute requirement to add technology debt stories, add documentation stories, so the product backlog evolves. It is a living, breathing corkboard. Similarly, we can remove anything from the product backlog at any point in time, or better still, the product owner has the permission to remove anything from the product backlog at any time. Here is a story that we thought we needed to do, but because of technology change, because of business change, because of legislation change, because of change, it's no longer required. So they grab the pin, they take the pin off the board, they take the index card, they rip it in half, and they throw it in the trash can. That's the beauty of Scrum. It allows us to be adoptive to change. The product owner owns the product backlog, cork board, and the product owner has the ability to manip manipulate, to change, to adjust, to focus the attention on what needs to be done through the product backlog. As we're going into our sprint planning meeting, our focus moves exclusively to the sprint ready stories and we select the next subset of sprint ready stories through the planning meetings and include that into our sprint backlog. And the sprint planning meeting creates the sprint backlog. There are many ways to present the sprint backlog. Again, I prefer it as another cork board. And I prefer to have my cork board somewhat organized. So in my sprint planning meeting, in the confirmation planning meeting, the team goes through and develops their strategy for how they're going to deal with all of the stories selected and assigned to the sprint. So we had 15 stories selected by the business owner, by the product owner rather, and said, I want these 15 stories to be completed in this sprint. In the second half of our planning meeting, the, story, the team went through and validated the estimates. Yes, I believe we have enough capacity. Yes, these stories look complete. Yes, I see no reason that these 15 stories should not be completed in the next sprint, in our next two weeks. And the last step of that confirmation meeting was to develop the plan. I like to have my sprint backlog presented in such a way that the plan says Fred is going to be working on these three stories and Betty is going to be working on these two stories and Sally is going to be working on these two stories and so on. Now, that assumes that Fred picks up story number one and carries it through to completion. Well, yes and no. That assumes Fred is the key team member who is going to work on story number one. That doesn't preclude Fred from saying, as I'm working on story number one, I expect to interact with Betty and have a meeting with Betty to confirm. And that doesn't preclude Ted or Fred from saying, and after the development is done, from handing this to Sally and say, now I want you to test this. And all that would happen, that was documented as part of the plan, as Fred completes his work on story number one from taking the pin out and moving it down here and assigning it to Betty and says, okay, Betty, it's now design ready. Please go ahead and do your design. Betty does her design. 
takes the pin out, moves it down here to Sally, and says, Sally, it's now ready for you to test. Sally would then say, and actually, I missed a step. As Fred starts work, Fred would move it over to here to number one. Apologies. Fred would then assign it to Betty. Betty would say, I'm doing the design. Betty would assign it to Sally, and Sally is doing the testing. And finally, when Sally is done, Sally would move it over here and say, story number one is complete. Not the only way to present a sprint backlog, but again, I find it's a very visual, very powerful way for people to, Fred, here's what I've done. Here's what I'm working on. Here's my, my successes. Betty, here's what I have ahead of me. Here's what I have in progress, and so on, and so on, and so on. So Steve's recommendation of a good sprint backlog, other people do it in a more serial way. They simply say, here are the 15 stories. and so on, and as the stories are complete, they simply remove them from the sprint backlog and we can watch the stories disappear. Or maybe, again, we use the same approach of to do, in progress, and done, but we don't assign them to names. We simply say, here are the 15 stories to be done. Here are the stories in progress. Here are the stories done. Again, I personally, maybe I'm a little more anal than I should be in a scrum approach, but I like the, the, the absolute visual representation and how it presents my sprint plan for completion and allows me to track my progress through to completion. And speaking of tracking progress, the last artifact we're going to discuss in this nugget is progress charts, which are used again for tracking progress. Most progress charts are either burn down charts, which says work remaining for the, cla the glass half full people, or alternatively, a burn up chart, which is the work completed for the glass half empty. They're both representing exactly the same progress in your sprint, it's just in this one, we're representing how much work is really left to be done. And in this one, we're representing how much work we've actually completed. And here again, excuse my artistic abilities, is a representative burn down chart. So at the beginning of our sprint, we've identified the total number of stories that are needed to be completed in the sprint. So in this particular sprint, we said we had eight stories to complete. And after three days in our sprint, we still have eight stories remaining. After another day in the sprint, we got two stories completed. Didn't complete any more stories for another couple of days and so on, but it's simply showing our progress and the, our, our progress towards achieving a zero stories left at the end of the sprint. The key to these progress charts, whether you're going with burn down, burn up, is visibility. They should be posted, they should be large, and they should be up to date. My preference is take a large piece of cardboard, put your basic graph with the maximum number of stories you would ever envision needing to be completed in a sprint, put the number of days we've agreed are in a sprint. This is a two week sprint, so are there 10 business days? Get that large piece of cardboard laminated and post it in a very visible place in your workspace. And then when you start the sprint, put a big circle around. This sprint is going to complete six stories. And then begin, begin to track your progress. And every day at the end of your, your, your daily scrum, you record the results and you determine your progress and you glance at that burn down chart in your scrum meeting that says, okay, team, we're halfway through. We've completed two of six planned stories. Are we on track? Are we on plan? Do we have any concerns? Recognizing that we, we typically have a period of time that we have to pick up and work on the stories that we often don't complete any stories at our first day or two do we still have confidence that we're going to achieve the results? And for those who like to look at exactly the same information, but with an upward trend, 
which is the way historically our minds are oriented to want to see progress. We like to see charts moving up. If you think, think of a profitability chart, if you think of, of most of the charts that we see presented at a corporate level, we always want to see our charts moving upwards, where in fact the burn down chart that we just presented, the trend is always downwards. So if you can accept the fact that your, your sprint is on track when your chart is moving downwards, then that's just great, the burn down chart. But a lot of people seem to get more motivation by seeing a chart moving upwards. So we present exactly the same information, except we call it the burn up chart. Same idea, number of stories to be completed, number of days in sprint, and we simply say that after day number three, we've got one story done, after day number five, we have three stories done, and so on, and again, our target is to have all eight stories done at the end of day eight. Same principle, large piece of paper, basic format, laminate it, and then use a marker and, and mark on it. Do, do not, or I, at least I would suggest, you do not need to have both a burn up and a burn down chart on your Scrum team. Pick the one that works best for you. And again, my experience is a lot of people seem to prefer the upward facing trending charts simply because that's what we are indoctrinated to believe is the proper direction for a chart to present. Personal choice only, but track the progress. Visible, visible, visible. And that's it for Scrum Artifacts. As I said in my introduction, True definition of Scrum artifacts are only the last three, the product backlog, all the stories to be completed, the sprint backlog, all the stories to be completed in the sprint, and the progress charts, the burn down, the downward sloping or the burn up, the upward sloping charts for progress and visibility. Steve likes to add in this extra artifact, which is the story, which is really the foundation for all of the above. There is one more artifact that a lot of teams like to use, and that's the completed stories corkboard. So as a sprint completes, and we take all of the stories off of the sprint backlog, a lot of people like to have a completed stories corkboard or a completed stories area in their project workspace where they begin to paper walls with dozens to hundreds of user stories completed. And again, I, I personally think that's a really good idea. It's a really good visual motivator that says, yes, if you look at that product backlog, there's still 45 stories that we have to complete. 45 stories at an average of eight stories per sprint. Wow, we still have a lot of work to do. But if you look at the completed stories corkboard, which has 350 stories, therefore, again, to me, this is just a, a good visible indicator of progress. The completed stories corkboard is not a true artifact from Scrum viewpoint. Scrum is once the work's done, it's done, we can forget about it. But again, I just think it's a good visual indicator to keep the team engaged and keep showing them how much work they've done. This concludes our nugget on Scrum Artifacts. I hope this module has been informative for you and thank you very much for viewing.